morning, brothers and sisters. We thank God that we can uh, come and worship Him again. Today, we will be uh, preaching based on the Romans 7 9. The sermon title is Sin Revived and I Died. We review uh, Romans uh, 7 5 and Romans 7 8. 11. In Romans 7 5, the text says, While we were in the flesh, the passions of sin through law were at work in my members, bear fruit for death. Apostle Paul has a brief statement to show us the relationship of the sin and the law and how it produced fruit of death in our members. And then in Romans 7, 8 to 11, he used these four verses to further explain how the sin worked through the law. So previously, we would see um, covet is almost uh, is equal to sin. And before knowing Christ, Apostle Paul did not know his sin. He may know the meaning of covet, but he did not see how this covet would would offend the holiness of God. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is perfect. The law of the law is perfect, reviving the soul. We thank you that we can study your word and we, we are confident the Holy Spirit will bring the life out of your word and would make that life to become our life. So we humbly submit ourselves to you. We invite the Holy Spirit to become our teachers, to teach us the truth of Christ, to lift up Jesus in our hearts, that we will become a better disciple, that we will be more obedient and will be willing to make disciples of all nations, especially around us in our own communities and we submit the rest of time in your hands guide us accept our worship we pray this in jesus name amen so let's read the uh, text again in romans uh, 7 verse 7 what then shall we say that the law is sin by no means yet it had not been for the law. I would not know, uh, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I once was alive, apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and the righteousness and good. In this verse 11, you see the function of sin through opportunity, uh, through the uh, commandment. Sin deceived me and killed me. These are the two areas that sin works in us. And in verse 8, you also see sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. So we see sin produced more sins. And it's, this sin is all kinds of covetousness. So we see sin is three function. One is to produce more sins. And second is to deceive us. And third is to produce that everlasting death. So today we'll concentrate only on Romans 7, 9. Apostle Paul says, I once was alive, apart from the law, 
But when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. You see, when he said, I once was alive, this is a relative term. term. And later he said, sin came alive and I died. So, we will look at this from the context uh, between 7 verse and the 12 verse. This is a context. And this is a relative term. And we would uh, break it down to five areas. The first one, we, we will explain what it means. I was once alive. Now, the, the contrast they said is this. Apostle Paul said, sin died and I lived. And then sin became alive again and I died. So, in fact, the sin never died. So in the biblical uh, uh, theology, the sin is in, in, in sleep. Sin slept. It's dormant. And at that time, we don't know our sin. And so we think we live. But when the commandment came, sin is awakened again. Sin used to be dormant. Now sin is awakened, and now I know my own sin, and I died. So, we will explain what it means when Apostle Paul said, I was apart from law once. In reality, no one was not under law. Everybody was born under the law. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Romans 5. Uh, we look at the, the famous uh, the analogy or the comparison between in Adam and in Christ. Apostle Paul said, Just as sin came into the world through one man, and the death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death ran from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So here we see death ran from Adam to Moses. Even during those periods, there was no proclamation of the law. But everybody died. So it means everybody was under the law. And in Galatians 3, 22 to 23, it further shows us how the law corralled all of us and put us under, under imprisonment, imprisonment of, of, of the law. So turn with me to uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. But the scripture in prison, everything under sin. In prison. Put everybody in prison. In prison. And this prison is the prison of sin. So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, before Christ came, we were held captive under the law. Everybody without Christ, were, was under the law, imprisoned until the coming face would be revealed. The coming face is Jesus Christ. So, before Jesus Christ came, everybody was under the law. So, so what does it mean? When Apostle Paul said, I was apart from law. We all knew he grew up the law. He's familiar with the law. And because of this law, he was zealous and he went on to persecute the church, persecute Jesus, and put people in prison because of this, this new uh, way. So he said, I once was without law. He did not know the definition and the function of law. Jews have, have law. Gentiles have law written in their heart. As in Romans 2.15, uh, Apostle Paul told us, 
So Apostle Paul concluded, both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under the law. And the law represents the relationship uh, of God and us, and God and his people. In Exodus 21, before the law pronounced the Ten Commandments, he told Israel that I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out from the land of slavery. So we see, before God declared the relationship between him and his people, and between people and people, he told us that the law is a picture of relationship. And this relationship has break it down in three areas. The first one is the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Second one is ceremonial law. Ceremonial is like a, how do you prepare the sacrifice? How do you spray the blood? How do you prepare the, uh, the, the, the clothing? And how do you wash yourself? And all those details. And how do you uh, lay the, uh, the bread? How do you let the light in, in the sanctuary? The, the table of bread represents the Christ. I'm the bread of life. And the light, the lamp, represents Jesus, the I am the light of the world. So in fact, the ceremonial law points to Christ. And the social law is based on the holiness of God. He tells that God is holy. So men's and men's relationship must be also holy. Okay, but today we're going to concentrate this law on the Ten Commandments. Now, Apostle Paul, in uh, verse 7, he brings our covetousness. He said, If not for the law, say, you shall not covet. He would not have known what is covetousness. So this is from uh, Exodus 2017, uh, the 10th commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So we see covet is not an outward action. It's an inner thinking, the intent, the motivation, the attitude, the thought of life. That's what Yahweh was pointing to uh, Israel. He wanted to see their inner heart. Okay? Now, secondly, Apostle Paul said, I once was apart from law, and I was alive. See, in here, even though he grew up in law, and he didn't really know, know the meaning of the law, the spiritual meaning of the law, he cannot see he is self-righteous. He cannot see his own ego, and he cannot see his pride. And that also applies to us. Many of us, we may know God and His Word. We may be familiar with the Bible, we may grow up in a Christian family. We may go to a Christian uh, 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 institute, but we cannot see our own pride, our own ego, our own righteousness. And Apostle Paul um, told us in these two areas about his own pride. First one is the Galatians, and the second one is the Philippians. So we look at Galatians first. He told the people in Galatia church, he said, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. That beyond is his pride. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. He's comparing himself with his colleagues, with his peers, that he is more uh, zealous in advancing the Judaism. Among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions, 
his pride about the tradition, and he thinking about he's more extreme zealous, more than everybody else. He didn't really know his pride. Apart from the law, even though he's familiar with the law, but he didn't really understand the spiritual meaning of law. And in Philippians 3, 5 to 6, he also boasted that I was circumcised on the eighth day. He was part of his law, from the law of the nation of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin. He's proud of his own birth. And then the Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, that's his pedigree. A Pharisee, that he's pride of his religion. As to zeal and the persecutor of the church, he's a fanatic. As to the righteousness, which is the law, bound blameless. He thought he fulfilled the requirement of the law. So he's an extremely prideful person apart from the law. Even though he grew up in the law, even though he's familiar with the Old Testament, even though he's familiar with the Mosaic law and the tradition of his father, but he didn't really know the heart of the law. So if you further to, to compare, after these commandments came, sin revived, and I died. So again, we go back to Exodus 20, 17. We look at this issue of covetousness. Covet is not, covet not others house, covet not others wife. And this covetousness, it's not an outward action. It's an inward thoughts, activities. It's the imaginations. It's a repeated thinking. It's motivation. It's an attitude. It's the thinking. No one can see. But it's not invisible to God. So he talks about Neighbor's wife, neighbor's house, neighbor's servants. This is all about thinking, not another not not activity, our activity. So in Psalm 24, 3, 4, the psalmist said, Who may ascend into the hill of the law, and who may stand in his holy place? It's just like we come to church, uh, we worship God together. We um, ascend to the hill of the Lord. We stand in His holy place. And who, who is equal to this? The psalmist said, Only those who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to false food, and has not sworn deceitfully. And this is all from the inner world of the believers. And further in Proverbs, 28 to 10, it told us that no one really can say bravely or with a clear conscience that I'm pure in heart. So the, the wise man says, a king who sits on the throne of justice, that's God's uh, attribute, he's just, disperse all evil with his eyes. God is holy, he cannot tolerate evil in his eyes. And then who can say, I have cleansed in my heart and I am pure from my sin? So no one can say this before a holy God. And what does it look like in our life, in the daily life? Different ways and different, different, differing measures. Both of them are abominable to the Lord. So when we treat people equally, uh, unequal, when we treat things unequal, when we measure ourselves and others with a different ways, it's an abomination to the Lord. So none of us have clean heart and pure hands without the blood of Christ, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we will see 
God's law is perfect. Law is holy, righteous, and good. So, in Psalm 19, 7 to 8, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. In the original uh, Hebrew word, it's to restore, restore, it's returning. The soul return to the person. How does that work? It because the word of God is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commencement of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Apostle Paul had a witness before the king. He said when he met Jesus on the road of Damascus, and later he was brought to the brother of Ananias, and Ananias anointing him, and after that, the scale of his eyes fell off, and he can see that he is truly a sinner. So this enlightening the eyes is because of the commandment that came. Christ came, Holy Spirit came, the anointing, and then he can see the things that he cannot see before. He no longer said, that I was apart from the law. Because the law was always there. It's because of his own sin. He cannot see his own uh, sinful uh, nature. Now, in uh, further down, in verse 12 and 13, the psalmist said, Who can discern his ears? We are a blind spot. We cannot see ourselves. Acquit me of hidden faults. But he's humble. He's willing to ask God to show him where he's fall, falling. Also, keep back your servants from presumptuous things. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless. And I shall be acquitted of great transgression. The psalmist has a humble heart that He's not sure of himself, that he's truly pure before God. So he prayed this kind of prayer. Now, Apostle Paul said, when the commandment came, sin revived. Okay, so we will understand the Ten Commandments through this covetousness, through the, the prohibition in the Tenth Commandment. So we, we would look at the Ten Commandments with the Tenth Commandment. How about one God? Do we desire to have more God in our life? More gods in our life? Chinese are like uh, Jews. They are all very family oriented. And they all uh, love our, their children. And they do everything for their children. To a point the children may be their own God. To a point, a, a, a stable family life can be their God. To a point, a career can be their own God. Covetousness, no idols. The three areas I just mentioned, the work, the family, the children, can be our idols. In our daily life, we spend a lot more time for them than thinking of God. And how about God's name only? Sometimes we seek our own name. We seek our children's name. We seek our family name. But do we put God's name above all this? Keep Sabbath. In the Nehemiah times, Nehemiah has a reform for the community. And in Sabbath, Jewish people, after the sunset, the door of the city is closed. But they would still stay outside the door and doing business. So Nehemiah would come and drag their head and reprimand them. The Sabbath is for the Lord. And do we really have a, a regular Sabbath before the Lord? Or are we desiring more things? Spend more time in working 
or doing the leisure things, you know, using the Sabbath day for our personal pleasure, for recreation. I pay parents, when our parents are getting old, are we taking care of them as the injunction of the Lord? Do we rob them of what we should give to them and for our personal enjoyment? And sometimes it's in religious terms, oh, I already gave, I already give it to the church, so I don't have anything left for, for my parents. Healing and adultery. Uh, Jesus teaches in Matthew 5 about healing is really beginning with the inner thought and our anger, our contempt for others. We already kill them. Adultery, it begins with the lust in our heart and that flow to, through our eyes. It's not, a, it's not an outward action. It's the inner thought life, the imagination, the, atten- the intention. Stealing. Do we steal other people's house? Or do we steal other people's wife? Not in the physical uh, sense, but do we, do we steal in our, them in our hearts? No lies. We can lie in our hearts. Keep thinking how do we reply to people so people will not have a true picture of ourselves. All this is the inner activities of our relationship with God and with people. So when the commandment came, when we really understand commandment through the lens of this inner desire, inner strong feeling, inner repetitive thinking, worrying and meditation, then we truly see we are truly sinners. So Apostle Paul said, when the commandment came, sin becomes a lie. So in 2 Timothy, he gave us a, a sniff about what is really is sin revived. See, we see, sin never ceases to exist. Never. It's always there. And Apostle Paul said, among all, oh, I'm the chief sinners. This is after he became a follower of Christ. Then he can see this. So we read in 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 15. When the commandment came, sin revived. What does sin revived look like? Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, he would not call himself a blasphemer. Before he was so zealous, he he, he think he, he was self righteous. He did it all for the law and for the pride of the Judaism and for the pride of uh, his uh, ancestral from, uh, tradition. And he was a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Now sin revived. He is a true picture of who he is as a sinner in three areas: blasphemer. Persecuted and aggressive. Yet I was shown mercy. Because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. Now you see, he said the greatest sins, he has no belief in the Creator God. And he's the ignorant. He didn't know what he was doing. And then in 15, he said, It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and among whom I am foremost of all. Before he was comparing himself, he's more advanced than all his colleagues, he's more zealous than his own people, and he went beyond many, many people. He sees all the faults of others, and he couldn't see himself as a blasphemer, as a persecutor, as an aggressor. But now he said, I'm the uh, foremost of all. I'm the chief sinner among all sinners. This is what it means. Sin revived. Sin became alive. 
And that's the whole purpose of the law, is to show us where we have fall short of glory of God, where we have fall short of the righteous requirement of the law. Lastly, sin revived and I died. He used to say, I once was apart from the law and I become alive. That's before the commitment came. But after the commitment came, the entirely opposite. Sin is not dead. Sin revived again, and I died. So in Romans 5, 7, 18, he has this uh, a picture of who he really is. He said, in my flesh, there is no good, goodness. There is no good thing. And he cried out, who can save me? And the turning point is, praise be God in Jesus Christ. So let's look at the Romans 7, 17 to 18. Apostle Paul, after the struggle, because he wanted to do the good, but he couldn't do. He does not want to do the evil, but he went on doing it. So he said, so now, no longer am I the one doing it. He's not making excuses. He's saying, I am a sinner, and the sin in me is doing this all this evil. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. See, notice this is all the present tense. This is after he become a follower of Christ, and he still struggles with sin. He said, nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. Now he has a true picture of who he really is before a holy God. He used to compare himself with his fellow sinners. But now he's able to compare himself with Christ. He said, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. He's cries out. He said, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? He was imprisoned by this sin. And he is split in his personality. He went crazy. But the turning point is, is thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God. But on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So you see there's two laws within him. But he know through Jesus Christ that he can become a victor. So the conclusion, when he said, I once was apart from the law and I was alive. Now let, let's look at this uh, uh, Romans 7, 9 again. I once was alive. He think he has a really good life apart from the law, apart from the condemnation of the law. He didn't know the law is holy, the law is just, the law is righteous. The law point to Christ. He used to establish his own righteousness. And now, he said, sin revived, I die. So sin was never dead. Sin was in sleep. And at the time, he thought he was alive. But when the commandment came, sin awakened from the sleep. And I died. So again, we go back to a psalm. It's all about restoring the soul. Our true soul returning to us. The original righteousness through the law of God the law of God is perfect law is holy and just and good and help us
to retain our soul through Christ. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. We used to think we are a good person, but now we knew we have fall short of glory of God. We know we defile God's holiness. We know we are worse than others. We used to only see others fall. Now we see our own fall. So in Philippians, uh, Apostle Paul was uh, uh, exhorting the, the uh, church in Galatians that each other should look at others more excellent than ourselves. Because of this enlightening of the eyes, we can see our own fault and we can see the goodness in other people. And then he continued to say, who can find out his own fault? Please acquit me of my hidden faults. I may have sinned against God and against people and I didn't know about it. So God, please show me. Keep you serving them from the purpose of uh, a sin. There's a lot of things and sins. We know it's very obvious, but we still commit it. And now we ask God to hold us back under the discipline of the Holy Spirit. Then though not those sins rule over me, and I'll be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression and new life. And lastly, the psalmist was caring about his inner life and his words. So he presented this to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, it's the inner thinking, the imagination, the thought, the attitude, the repetitive thinking, the longing, the strong feeling. May those activities be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. See, only through this inner life of strong feeling in this area of captainness that we see ourselves, this commandment came. And we know we are sinner. And we die. And then we cry out to God. And then He gave us a poor in spirit. And so we can see the kingdom of God. He give, he give us that spirit of mourning and we mourn for our sin. And then we are comforted. So may God help us. If our relationship with our spouse, with our colleague, with our children are not healthy or are in bad situation, may the Lord help us that we will come back to the Lord and ask His forgiveness and go to the people, ask people forgiveness. And so we continue to practice, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this series of uh, teaching through our relationship to the law. Apostle Paul kept teaching us that we have died to the law because we cannot fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. So we no longer use law as a means of salvation. We no longer use those good works as a way of salvation. Instead, we will confess our faith in Christ. We know that even law is good. The problem is our own sin. So help us that we follow the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will pour out the love of God into our heart. And then we can, by the power of Jesus, and by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we can fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. And we can have our sin forgiven in Christ. And we can have love from the Holy Spirit to love God with all our heart, all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. And we can love others as ourselves. To your name be glorified. May you
fill your church with your holy law and by the power of the Holy Spirit we will meditate your law day and night. We, we pray this in the victorious name of your son Jesus.